Well, 10 weeks ago, we joined the children of Israel on a 40-year journey from Egypt. We miraculously passed through the Red Sea. We've drunk sweet water from the, the bitter oasis of Mara. We've eaten bread from heaven. We've drunk water from a rock. We've received rules to live by at Mount Sinai and a tent so that God could travel with us. We've escaped God's anger when we should have been punished when we were worshipping a golden calf. And we've been led through the desert by a pillar of fire. And we've been bitten by snakes for our complaining and our blaming. And we've been saved by looking at a bronze serpent. Moses is now dead. And under the leadership of Joshua, we are here now at the edge of the promised land in front of the Jordan River. So what was the point of these 40 years? Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2 says, You shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. And here's the explanation. <clears throat> that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So, one of the points was that they would see what was in their hearts. And I pray that as we've uh, journeyed in the promised land, that we've seen that some of the things maybe that were in the children of Israel were in us, that we would see what is in our hearts, like complaining and blaming and worshipping things other than God, unbelief and plain disobedience. I've certainly seen some of these things in myself and I've had to go to God and say, Lord, forgive me for my complaining. Forgive me for my blaming. And Lord, make me different. Because I've seen a little bit of what is in my heart. But then there was another point. It goes on to say, he humbled you. And this time it says, he let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. God lets us hunger. Why does he do that? He takes away from us the thing that we need so that he can give it back to us. And in the meantime, we cry out to him for these things. Our need drives us to him and we learn that life is more than what we see and feel and it's more than us trying to work it out and uh, consulting google god is the source of all things not our knowledge not our intelligence not our natural resources he wants us to know we don't live by those things but we depend on every word that proceeds out of his mouth you know, what's encouraging in this story, though, is that when we look forward a few years, <clears throat> we find that this generation, um, having gone through all these trials in the wilderness and seen God's miraculous provision and watched their parents die because of their unbelief and sin, they actually did learn a few things. They actually did possess the land. And in most cases, they conquered these giants. So if we look further ahead in Joshua 21, it says this in verse 43, Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. How wonderful that that generation learnt the lessons. Joshua 21, 45 goes on and it says, and this is beautiful, not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. Every one of them came to pass. So God kept the promises that he'd made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that he would give them the land. Hallelujah. But there are two more things that had to happen before they got into the land. And we're going to look at these uh, this morning. First of all, they had to cross the River Jordan in the flood season. 
We see the same principle at work as before. God made it impossible so that he could provide. By their natural means, there was no way over this river. Hudson Taylor, the uh, incredible missionary that started the uh, China Inland Mission and against all the odds, uh, brought the gospel to China so that millions of Christians, uh, there are millions of Christians in China today because of the vision and the faith of that man. And he said this, he said, God's way of doing things, first, impossible, second, difficult, third, done. First, God makes it impossible. That drives us to him. And then it keeps him, he keeps it difficult. That keeps us praying. And finally, we find that it's done. So how did they do it in this instance? There were no pontoon bridges to build over the river. There was no machinery to dig under the river. Do you remember in my last talk, I talked about Deborah's song. And she talked about two groups of people she was rejoicing in when she rose up um, with Barak and uh, they conquered the land in their day. She says this in Judges 5 2, that the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly. Bless the Lord. Two groups of people there, the leaders and the people. First of all, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the leaders in Joshua uh, 3 and verse 6, it says Joshua said to the priests, this is what they had to do. They were the spiritual leaders at the time. Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and they went ahead of them. So these leaders, who were they? They were the praying people. They were the people close to God. Let's read the story. Chapter 3, verse 11. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. And they were carrying the presence of God into the ark. Verse 13, and as soon as the priests who carried the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and they'll stand up in a heap. It was God who was going to part the waters of Jordan. And the ark of the covenant was symbolic of the presence of God. So the priests, the people of prayer, went ahead, carrying God into the situation. But unless they'd been prepared to go into and put their feet into the swirling waters of the Jordan River, that they would never have passed through. But they did. They picked up the ark, they took their life in their hands, and they stepped boldly into the foaming water. This is a picture of prayer. See, God has ordained that, the, that uh, prayer paves the way for the people to go through. Do you remember John Wesley? That man probably affected uh, this nation more than any other Christian man. And during his lifetime and his faithfulness, and he used to pray a couple of hours at the beginning of each day. And he said this, God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. Unless there's prayer... Nothing happens, is what he said. There could be words, but there'll be no power. You know, we had a wonderful prayer meeting at Bassett Street a week ago last Tuesday, when Brother Norman from Bassett Street, some of our friends from Rev, and about 14 new lifers were there. We were priests, standing in the waters with the presence of God. We were preparing the way for God to come into our lives, into the church, into the area. You know, the Bible talks about the work of prayer, but prayer is also a joy. Personally, I really look forward to a prayer meeting. Sometimes it's a sacrifice to get there, but the exciting thing is that the ark of God is there. 18 years ago, we started a prayer meeting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the area. I reckon that we have probably prayed about a thousand hours in those prayer meetings over the years. But you know, that's nothing on Bassett Street. In that church, for 160 years, prayers have been going up for the area. It used to be called Kentish Town Mission. 
It's a wonderful picture that we were given um, by Ruth at Bassett Street. And uh, there's uh, her mother is actually in this picture, top left. These six people are holding a sign. This is in the 1930s, and it says, Young Christian Workers, if you want a revival, here's your opportunity. Come and pray for it. Don't you love that? Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there. So that applies to praying in a Zoom meeting, praying when you're at Cafe Nero with a friend, praying with your spouse, praying with your flatmates. The Bible teaches where two or more people who are in agreement pray, there is great power. Going ahead in prayer is leading. If you want to be a leader, anyone in a prayer meeting is a leader. They are going into the water first, carrying the ark of God's presence, making a way for others to go through. God uses praying people for his work. Do you remember Joshua spent time uh, with God when Moses had left the tabernacle? Joshua stayed on and he lingered after Moses had gone. He was a man of God's presence. This story of crossing the Jordan tells us that unless we are praying, the people will not go through. If God has called you to serve others in leadership, maybe as a parent in your family, in reaching others with the gospel, or in any area of church life. This story tells us that unless we pray for the people or the task we are responsible for, the people will not go through, the task will not be done. I'm not talking about spending hours in prayer, just uh, taking the time simply and sincerely to ask for God's help. It's a very powerful thing. So what happened? The people went through. And then the second thing, consecration. What does this word consecration mean? Joshua 3 and verse 5. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. God can't do this for us. Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Going back to Deborah's song, she said that the leaders took the lead but that the people offered themselves willingly, bless the Lord. Unless the people had come out of their holes to defeat the enemy and be, put themselves forward as warriors, nothing would have happened. God needs prayer, but he needs consecrated people. I truly believe that if we as God's people will, will pray, and if we as God's people will consecrate ourselves, we will see amazing things. So what does this consecration word mean? For Isaiah, it was very, very simple. He'd seen God. And God said to him in Isaiah 6, 8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? What was Isaiah's response? Here am I. Send me. Have you ever said that to God? Today is your opportunity. You see, God doesn't need our ability he requires our availability. God is not looking like for a group of beautiful people like you see in some of the worship videos. He's not looking for strong people. He's not looking for intelligent people. He's looking for available people. Maybe weak people who say, God, I don't know how I can do anything for you, but I'm willing. That's what Gladys Aylwood said, didn't she? So how did this work out for Israel? Well, in the place called Gilgal, which was the camp across the other side of the Jordan, it says all the males of Israel had to be circumcised. And this was a painful experience. All this old generation that had died had been circumcised. All the males had been circumcised. But none of those born during the 40 years in the wilderness had. For the Jews, circumcision was the sign of entering into an agreement with God, the covenant of Abraham. They were entering into an agreement. They were committing themselves to serving him. So circumcision was also a picture of the end of the old and a new beginning. Colossians 2.11 describes it. It says, in union with Christ, you were circumcised, not with the circumcision that is made by human beings, but with the circumcision made by Christ, which consists of being freed 
from the power of this sinful self. In Jesus there is a spiritual circumcision where we are freed from the past and the power of that sinful nature. Being born again and baptised is a freeing from the sinful self. You see, God wanted these Israelites to go into the promised land, trusting in him for the future, but unencumbered by the past. This word Gilgal, where they're camped, um, was specifically named Gilgal because it means rolling away. And this is what it says in Joshua 5, 9. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so that's the name of that place, uh, Gilgal, to this day. I wasn't sure what reproach really meant, so I looked it up in the dictionary and it's quite interesting. It says that to reproach someone is to express one's disapproval of or disappointment in their actions. Disapproval. Disappointment. Have you ever felt that God disapproves of you? Have you ever felt shameful? Have you ever felt um, disappointed and discouraged by the way you have behaved through things you've done or maybe things that you've not done? I'm sure the children of Israel felt the same way. And this was a day when the, the reproach was rolled away. So the story of this journey started with the shedding of the blood of a lamb in Egypt. And this reproach has something to do with this. Because the end of this story, fittingly, 40 years later to the day, was another Passover. A picture of Christ, our Passover. And it is his blood that allows us to break free from our guilt and shame and disappointment and discouragement. As it says in the first chapter of Revelation, verse 5, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. What an amazing verse. That when we confess our sin, he frees us from the guilt. When we put our trust in him rather than our, in ourselves, he releases us from the power of sin and selfishness in our lives. How wonderful. So as we finish this morning, I want to just ask you three questions. Number one, is God calling you to go ahead in prayer, to pave the way for God to do amazing things in our children, in the people we love, in those who do not yet know Jesus? Number two, am I consecrated to God? Can I say like Isaiah, Lord, in this season of my life, here am I. I'm here. I'm available. Do whatever you want with my life. Number three, am I held back by disappointment, discouragement or shame? Jesus died to wipe the slate clean, to wash us in his blood, to give us a fresh start, to release us from the reproach of Egypt and from the power of that sinful, selfish nature and from the failures of the past. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for uh, the way that he taught us how to pray by going ahead at the beginning of the days to pray for his disciples and the things he was going to do, Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for us on the cross, Lord, for shedding your blood to forgive us all our sins, for breaking the power of sin and self on the cross. Thank you, Lord, that you have an amazing plan for our lives and you want to do amazing things. Teach us to pray, Lord. Help us to pray. And Lord, today we consecrate ourselves we give ourselves to you lord we say lord here am i send me whatever you want to do and where we are unwilling father we say that we are at least willing to be made willing lord 
And Father, we pray that you would wash away our disappointments and our discouragements. Father, we thank you that this is a new day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.